here at Somtao's house in Bangkok. A living legend, and I don't exaggerate, this man is phenomenal. The position that you've been elevated to recently is sounds just a, such an honour. The Thai Minister for Culture has, has appointed you as... A national artist? Well, I would say this. Key figures in the arts are singled out to, to be made national artists. And in, in England, these figures are given knighthoods or OBEs or, or something. And, um, and it's a similar sort of thing. And sometimes you wonder uh, how they go about choosing them. It does have advantages. Yes. For one thing, if I die, I get a state funeral. <gasps> Do you really? Yeah, that means I don't have to worry about who's going to pay for the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> but that's quite something to look forward to, a state funeral. <laughs> yeah, except I won't be around. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to pretend to die so I can have, it, have the funeral so I can enjoy it. And you can watch. Right a Like, like, <laughs> like uh, Tom Sawyer. Yeah, right, like Tom Sawyer. <laughs> Well, Michael Tippett again, he, he became, when he became Sir Michael Tippett, he loved it because everyone called him Sir Michael. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's great because he loved being called by his first name. Yeah, right. And you love being called by your first name. And you are one of these people like Madonna uh, and <laughs> that you're known by your first name. Yes. I, I just think that is so cool. Well, one, one reason is quite simple. And my books used to come out under my full name. And when I did Vampire Junction, one of my most well-known books actually, my publisher said, she said well, we're going to try to push this to a larger market and we want your name to be something people won't be afraid to ask for in the, yeah. at, the, at the counter. So would you mind changing it? And they wanted you know, to change it to like John Smith or something. But, but, but I, I said, no, I, I sort of said, okay, uh, in, in my culture, this is, you know, play the culture card, you see. You know, names are very sacred and they can only be changed by an astrologer, you know, which is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so I'll just let you use my first name as, and put initials on it. Brilliant. And that's how people started using that. And, uh, but that's so... That's how I became a one name. Uh, yeah, that's really person. clever. You've got so many things you can do, so many creative uh, streams of creativity that it's almost hard to know where to start and the question that first came to mind was if you had one only one of these disciplines that you could do which one would you not be able to live without <clears throat> that question right i think that the whole theory that i do like three or four different things mm. is is sort of fundamentally flawed because in in my thought processes it's all one thing. Right, right. You see, um, I, I started writing novels because um, when I came to Thailand the first time in the 70s, I, I was trying to do the, this huge uh, contemporary music revolution. Mm, mm. Uh, I was blending like um, classical Thai music with, uh, with Western music. Yeah. That sort of, I was saying that, um, that I was teaching the kids that the writer's ring was about sex when mm. they thought it was about dinosaurs mm. and the thing is that after that I happened to watch on YouTube a, a, a video of Leonard Bernstein teaching a youth officer how to play the writer's ring yeah and so I the first thing he said was now kids I want you to understand that this piece is all about sex so I realized that I must be on the right track because, uh, but then, but the point is I'm trying to make is though that, see, the kids were playing Marlowe's first symphony. It begins with the note D played seven octaves deep, mm. just mm. like hanging in the air. Mm. And um, Marlowe says, via natura laut, like a sound of nature. So we were touring in Europe. And we stopped at Marla's birthplace. And so I said to them, okay, we're now in the forest where Marla used to run away to hide when he was a kid. And you have to listen to the way this forest sounds. And then you can play the opening of Marla's first symphony 
correctly. That's the sound he's trying to reproduce. Mm. What, so what I'm saying is that you have sometimes you have to go to the extra musical things in order to illuminate the music. You have to, you know, I, I'm not a fan of like interpreting everything like a biography of the composer, but sometimes it helps to understand what might be, have been in his mind. Yeah, I, well, a lot of people think that composers kind of, they write music in this vacuum. They don't see them as people who had real lives. I did a lot of studies about Puccini because right. I wrote a show about Puccini and yes. found that all of the leading ladies from his operas were based on women in his life. I mean, I, they, of course they were. And that's why they're so... Masochistic? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say authentic, but... Uh, they, yes. He must have been quite cruel to some of them because look at how they suffer in, in his operas. Well, he was cruel because he probably <laughs> he was very wealthy and he was he was an alpha male Italian right. at the turn of the century. <laughs> he did what he liked, and often they were ladies. Uh, the, these girls were of a lower status. They were, might be like working in the bar, mm -hmm. like Minnie in Panjula del West, mm -hmm. or a servant in the house, like Liu in Turandot. You know, he, he didn't choose ladies who were his equal. Right. Well, he, that's he, part of his he, No, even Mimi in 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 Bohem, many people think that she's like basically a, a gay Parisian, but she's actually sort of a prostitute. And Musetta certainly is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, they all are. They're just different grades. So yeah. I think that Puccini certainly probably saw these women in not quite the same way as we see them as as these. Haughty divas. He probably didn't see them quite that. Much. But that's because we see them singing loftily <laughs> on stage and right. they're singing gorgeous top seas and stuff. <laughs> but you know, that absolutely though, they were real people, and people for, they forget that yes. composers are real people. I used to know mm. Michael Tippett really well, and mm. he was a cheekiest. He was like a kid in a way. He was just like this cheeky boy, and um, and I think <clears throat> you as well. You've got this sort of almost like child. Well, I feel very, you, that... funnily enough, I feel very connected with Tippett, you see. Because, you know, Tippett, in many ways, is my favourite British composer. So. Mm, mm. So. <laughs> but he also wrote his libretti. and um... well, his own libretti, which is something I do, yes. Yeah. And he conducted, which is something you do. Now, he didn't make movies like you, though. Like, this movie that you made, The Maestro, that was absolutely amazing. And it did so well. It won, won all these awards. Well, you recently won the Ennio Morricone Award in, from Naples. For, yeah, for Best Soundtrack. You played the maestro in this. Well, only only because the director, Paul, said, look, you've written this character. You've got to play him yourself because it's basically just you, only a little bit madder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, okay, I won't direct it unless you play it yourself. So, yeah. So I ended up... Um, but you were perfect for it. Was Jasmine Knight's sort of semi-autobiographical? Oh, well... Well, it's not as autobiographical as some people think, but there's certainly a lot of my autobiography. But you didn't live with your two aunts. In, no, in I lived. With, I actually lived with my parents. Yeah. But but the that that estate, and that that sort of way of life, which has completely vanished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that that, that was in my childhood. There was a small group of people in Bangkok, who only spoke English with, with sort of hideous public school accents. <laughs> And all, all that, and they were part of the part of the group of, group of aristocrats who emigrated to England with King Rama the Seventh. Was he exiled? Well, n n not officially, but he. But after the revolution, he sort of mm. moved to England and spent mm. most of his life there. Ah, um, and is that why you went to Eton then? Because it was a tradition in the family to go. No, actually, I was the first non-royal of Thai to go there. But but King Rama the Seventh had gone there. In fact. Yeah, people in my family probably wanted to emulate. There was a group of people, and most of them have passed away. These people who felt very British, you know, when they came back to Thailand, uh, um, and who who spoke that way. Now the the English speaking population of, of Bangkok is completely different. Yeah. Uh, they have quite a lot more influenced by Americans, for example. Yes, and. Um, but that, that was this period, it's, which is gone forever now, where, yeah. where there was this sort of strange island of, 
of completely culturally isolated people yeah. in Bangkok. Well, they were Thai people, but they didn't speak Thai. They they, they did. They did, but they didn't but they, on a daily basis. But but basically, they it's like the Russians speaking French, French. and only speaking Russian to the servants. Yeah. They, they felt it was a bit like that. Yeah. So it was sort of the language of the court. Right. Uh, well, because the Romanovs and they all spoke. They, all, they all, speak, all spoke French. They were all speaking French all the yeah. time. Right? And it was only the serfs who spoke Russian. Right. And of course, the, Ro the Romanovs had to. They had to speak French because the you know they the wives were all uh, Queen Victoria's daughters. Yes. They, they didn't speak Russian. Yeah. You know? uh. so, so they had to have a common language. So I I lived in Thailand from the ages of seven to twelve. Were you, were you not born in Thailand? I was. I left when I was eight months old. Yeah. So, uh, so and you went to England. Yeah. With your parents, and you, they were both very young when they had you. Yeah, no, I, yeah. My father was still doing his Oxford uh, doctorate. Yeah, because your father was a legendary lawyer, and he just uh, passed right. away not very long ago. Right. When I came back to Thailand, at the age of seven, I couldn't speak Thai very well, right, or at all, really. And so that part of the book is sort of true. That, uh, and, and there were only two English-speaking schools at the time, really. The, where Patina and B I S B because mm. the the others we, the Harrow Shrewsbury and all that most of the kids are aren't actually native speakers yeah so they've acquired this international school accent yeah and they all have it it's it's quite it's quite interesting but it's an internet accent too it's a, yeah it's also an internet accent right exactly a lot of these uh, international students play in the Sion Sinfonietta yes mostly string players but the wind and players you you, you get the, the thing is that that Thailand has had a really strong wind playing tradition, mm. and the best wind players, and in, in, in terms of school players, come from schools like Watsuti School, which is a, a Thai school that has a uh, this the wind orchestra. So they're always winning international awards and stuff yeah. like that. But but the string playing hasn't been taught very much until recently. Yeah, and it's been the international schools that have really push the, the string agenda. I was just remembering your uh, trumpet player in Handel's Messiah and how mm. amazing he was. Do you remember all those descants that he played? It was amazing. And you told me that, oh, he wasn't that particularly ambitious about his playing. You thought that maybe he was going to go and open a coffee shop in Koh Samui? He did. He, right after that concert, he went and opened a coffee shop in Koh Samui. Is that where he is now? Yes. Because I'm going there in two weeks, I'm going to go for coffee. And does he play the trumpet in his, in his cafe? Yeah. In my last concert, when I did the Messian and Shostakovich, he flew back for that. That's pretty cool. They can't, uh, they can't quite stay away. Yeah. <laughs> but do you find that the students don't have like ambition? Because I find that Westerners, uh, they're very ambitious. Um, I know a lot of singers and instrumentalists because I went to music college in London and there was a real drive to be the best and they were really, really pushed themselves. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I find perhaps in Thailand there's a kind of laid back attitude to ambition really, I suppose. Well, one thing is that music is still considered an easy degree here, here which of course in real life it isn't. A lot of you are actually going to be a successful musician. Mm. And there's still a sort of genteel, sort of amateurish feeling about the yeah. whole thing. And, and, you know, for example, there's a, a Korean tenor and he's singing in Faust at the moment um, back in, in, in Dublin and he's singing the lead role in Faust. He's amazing. And you do see a lot of Korean singers and they're Everybody, absolutely yeah. brilliant. And not just singing, I imagine. But is it just that they have this work ethic? Well, it's the work ethic. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, um, I, I think it's something that, that they have since from childhood, mm. this this fierce competitiveness. Mm. It's not really part of our local culture, this, this, this competing thing. It's more like, oh, let the other one have it, sort of thing. So there's a sort of a generosity or... In, in a way. Um, is it a Buddhist thing? Yeah, it probably. Yeah. Or it's, it's generosity combined with sort of laissez-faire. You know? Yeah. Well, some people, you look at them and you, you say they could really mm. be a world-class musician. Yeah. And sometimes it's a little disappointing, but then a few of them have managed to do it anyway, and 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 more and more than before. And with directors, you have to fight like crazy. You do so because there was a time, perhaps some would say, the glory days of opera, when the conductor actually directed. 
Gustav Mahler actually directed the performances that he conducted. Oh. It used to be like the norm, that gradually that we, there were these people who didn't know anything about opera. Yeah, they came from theater. Or were still, uh, uh, sometimes they're film directors. Yeah, so like Baz Luhrmann or something. I'm not saying he doesn't mm -hmm. know anything, mm -hmm. but... Zeffirelli mm -hmm. really understood opera. Yeah, of yeah. course. Even though he's a film director, he really... Uh, but it's probably in his blood, you know, the, or something. And the other one, Visconti. Yeah, Vis Visconti. Um, Callas. All of these, they yeah. were surrounded by the greats. Yeah. But they also loved the singer. Right. They knew the singer was doing like a really hard job. And they also loved the composer. Because sometimes you wonder, do opera directors like, do they really not like these pieces at all? Do they not like this opera? Um, but very often they're just trying to make a statement. Because it's been done so many times, they just yeah. think, we'll set it on the moon. We'll set Bohem on the moon. Yeah, I, I heard that. I never saw that production. I heard it was much better than people said. People <laughs> but didn't they have like... Yeah, uh, they were, oh. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty silly. The last time I did Bohem, I said, let's move it to um, Chagall's Paris. Oh, I love Chagall. And then I made each scene like a Chagall painting mm. and come to life. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. But love Chagall. But also... I wish I owned one. I, <laughs> There's one over there! There, there right there. Right <laughs> There's there. one. And what's the upcoming movie that's um, most exciting for you right, that you're thinking right now? Well, um, this movie began because um, a, a lady who, um, who mostly works for the film department for the government she had produced a documentary about architecture in Thailand, influenced by Venetians. <laughs> and she said to me, wouldn't it be nice to do a ghost story mm. that had something to do with Venice? Mm. And I took, put on my thinking cap and I came up with, with the plot of Phoenix, right, which is a simple movie about a cursed manuscript. It's actually removed from Venice in the yeah. 1600s. Yes, right. And finds its way to... Ayutthaya, right. So that, that's my way of sort of combining Thailand and Venice. And Ayutthaya was the ancient capital of Thailand. Right. And the thing is that um, it was a hugely metropolitan city with a large communities of, of, of Europeans. Mm. And, and almost, that's almost been completely forgotten. Because now it's just these um, yeah, it's just monuments movie, yeah. or yeah. ruins. Yeah, it, it was one of the biggest cities in the world at that time. It wasn't on the Silk Road, was it? Um, no, you see, the thing is that China and Japan have, have become closed, hmm. and uh, Ayutthaya was actually the, the real center of trade in the 17th century. So it, everything was going through there. Mm -hmm. This is the, not the Silk Road, but the, the, the ocean road, the sea road. Yeah, and on this particular occasion, uh, someone brought this manuscript of an opera and hid it in the in somewhere in the dungeons of this right. Of those right. So, so the idea is that the opera is tangled up in this love triangle, and the only way the knot can be untied is for the people who have been reincarnated from the love triangle in the present to go back in time and undo the the the, the trauma. Basically, that's the. The theory of it, and, and is it resolved in the end? Yeah, well, we'll we'll, we'll see. I mean, maybe I'll shoot two endings. So one, yeah, one, yeah. one where it's not resolved. You can have a choice. Yeah, well, it's that, that way. Uh, or a sequel. A, a sequel. Yeah. yeah. Is this a genuine opera, or is this an opera that you are going to create for the oh for the occasion? Well, see, the, well, well. One of the things is that um, Francesco Cavalli wrote forty or fifty operas, but I think twenty eight of them are lost. Mm, so that's ideal then. So. I, I thought, well, let's imagine a lost opera by Cavalli, mm. and let's imagine that because of this thing that happened, that the opera happens to have the same plot as a famous Thai legend. The, and this legend happens to be quite similar to the Western legend of the Phoenix. Mm. So it's basically going to be Thai music written as Italian Baroque music. I do find that like Baroque period um, music and even pre-Baroque music and dance does seem to sometimes feel kind of Moorish or Arabic. That's very true. I think that um, the earlier music is, is less forceware than it mm. became in the classical period. Mm. Mm. Um, this Rococo thing that yeah. happened. Yeah, that, well, well, it's because they believe that everything should balance perfectly. Because Monteverdi sounds Arabic sometimes, doesn't it? It does, yeah, absolutely. And Monteverdi was Cavalli's teacher. Yes, indeed. So in a way, he kind of eclipsed everyone because his the, music is so... He's both his, Better than everybody else. <laughs> yes. But no, remember those? You can't do that. Remember those? Right. So 
So, uh, of course, you're far too mature to have some. Oh, I never do. Never, no. So, full control so of my temper. A high official of the fine arts department came down and he said, Well, well, um, we have scientifically determined that modern music is going to harm the strings of the piano. Oh, gosh, so they were protecting the piano by removing it. Yeah, they were protecting for its yeah. own protection from yeah, the, yeah. the, the ravages. So they thought you were going to hit it with a oh, hammer and stand well, up on top of well, it. Well, we were, but. <laughs> <laughs> you're right! I didn't have this career because writing novels is a different stream of consciousness from writing music. Right. I started doing that because I had I I went went into this huge block. I couldn't produce a note. Oh, Nothing so you turned away mind. from music because of these kind of obstacles that yeah. you come up. And you and you turned to writing novels and out of sheer Well, basically it was a way to work up work myself free of the block. Mm. See I thought, well, I used to love these fantasy and science fiction stories when mm. I was a child. Mm. If I write some of these, it'll help to um, to ease the block, and then I'll go back to music as soon as it's over. Oh, I see. But it wasn't over for twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> but it just seems to me like you're one of these people who can turn to something, anything really, and you just go into it in such a deep way. You're almost a little bit like obsessive. Are you? Do you stay up all night to three in the morning thinking about this and working? I can see you sort of working at your desk into oh, the small hours. Five in the morning. Five in the morning. No, no, really. Uh, one of the character flaws of, of people like me is, is this kind of strange obsession. Mm. But I think this obsession is characteristic of a really creative person. It, it probably And it is. comes with the territory. Probably. And it can make them quite difficult to live with. Very, right? very. I, you, as you may have noticed, I haven't been able to live with anybody very much. Well, I always think of you as people, you have so many people around you, people yeah. who love to be people, around you. People are here all the time, yeah. right? right. Yeah. That's very true. And, uh, and, and since I came back to Thailand, I've been, I've always been surrounded by young people. This, this may actually get back to one of the things I know you wanted to talk about, which is the, the educational process, mm, mm, right? Because mm. I, I think you were saying before, before we met today that, 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 since you, yours is an educational channel, yes. that this might be something we, we touched know, on. Well, exactly, yeah. and it's interesting. And I do have a little bit of experience right. uh, in Thailand because I did one of those courses for teaching English. <clears throat> right. And what really struck me was that there were certain important things you hadn't had to remember. For instance, they said, don't say negative things to the students. Don't criticize the students in front of somebody else. Uh, don't fail the students in an exam. Don't... <laughs> so, it seemed to me they were very, very protective of children. It's very hard to learn if you can't say negative things to someone and it's also hard for the students because they can't question the teacher because it's culturally frowned upon to question someone who's older or more experienced than you. So you can't say, teacher, actually I've read somewhere that I think you're wrong there, you know. So mm -hmm. these kind of discussions don't seem to happen. And uh, since I don't teach in a formal setting, I welcome the idea of being questioned. Yeah, I'm sure you do. And uh, this is actually one of the things that makes our orchestra work. Mm. work. The, the Sinfonietta. Yeah, the Sinfonietta. Which is, which is a just orchestra. so wonderful. I love it. And it, this is like your really special creation. I think it's one of the things I, I've created that I hope will live on. You know, playing classical music is is the way you learn to play music. If you can play classical music properly, you can play other kinds of music. Oh, you mean classical as in, as in that period? Yeah. Classical. Because they always say that about singers too. They say, can you sing Mozart before you sing Puccini or any of right. that lovely stuff? Right. Every note has to be beautiful. But when people come to me for advice in auditioning, I tell them to avoid Mozart whenever possible. <laughs> because it exposes everything. Be because really. they, because they'll give all their shortcomings will yeah. be revealed. Oh, but it's because it's so perfect as well. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah it's There's absolutely perfect. Not a note wrong. And so if you slightly, oh, it's just glaringly obvious if you, you know. Right. And, and it's important to, to, that the kids can distinguish between what's intended as an effect Yes. And what, what's intended as like every note really counts. But that's what they learn from you. Yes. And that is this thing that you can explain to them that it's, you know, it's colours and it's, um, it's not all about accuracy, but sometimes it's about the moment and the, and the emotion. And I just wondered also, my experience is that Thai people 
can be very emotionally reserved. When they're in the presence of uh, older people or when they're in a situation which is quite formal, they get very reserved. And when it comes to performing classical music, where so often you have to be emotionally explicit, you have to, you have to let yourself go and just, in a sense, get naked, you know? Do they find that hard? At first, because uh, in traditional Thai music, and I don't mean Thai, Thai symphonically, I mean traditional folk music, Thai, Thai, you know, court music, or uh -huh. that kind of music. The actual perfect way to play is to have a completely straight face. Right. But because the theory is that you must complete, your ego must disappear, mm. and the music should speak oh. alone. Mm. Right. And the music is a timeless, Thing that, and, and you're sort of part of a huge river of it. But Western music, in a large measure, is about the interpretation. It's because these notes are here, and it's what you say with the notes that is the performance, not the actual notes that are. That, that's just the sort of the blueprint. What they're learning from their teachers is how to play the notes perfectly. Yeah. And what I'm trying to give them is why they are playing those notes, why they have to play those notes in that way. Mm -hmm. And this is something that seems not to be as present in the way music is taught. See, that, that's the thing, I'm not there to replace all the technical stuff that they're mm -hmm. getting from the teachers, mm -hmm. but, but I think that what I do with them gives them an edge. Do they gain a certain confidence from you to let go and to yeah, take do. a few risks? Yeah, and risks are very important. I mean, I. I rarely conduct the same piece of music the same way twice. Um, that's that's one of the reasons I think that our orchestra has had such a big success in Europe. Yes, because you've been in Germany recently, and um, you've been going back and forth for a, quite a number of years. Germany frequently. Yeah. Um, other countries, Austria. Um, we um, we did, been to the United States four times. Yeah, um, Carnegie Hall. Three times. Carnegie Amazing. Hall, yeah. And. Um, and the orchestra has played in many major halls, like the Musikverein in Austria, mm -hmm. which, which, uh, which is, you know, people feel excited because, okay, this is where Brahms actually conducted. They find that exciting and they're not jaded about it. No, it's exciting. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, they get to travel, play in really famous venues, and they rise to the occasion. They don't get overwhelmed by it. That's because you give them this great, you know, this great grounding in what they're doing. Well, I, I, I found that sometimes um, you have to get to the music by not talking about music, per se. We were the, actually the first orchestra to perform the Rite of Spring in Thailand. That's amazing. And, Did it go down well? Oh yeah, it went down very well. And, it's a great uh, piece. What was so exciting was that um, a lady um, um, in her 90s was in the audience who had actually been a member of the Ballet Russe. <laughs> Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me. It's been absolutely an honour. You really are something of a legend, you know that. I mean, it's quite right. special for uh, me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I know you don't want to be a legend. Well, I'm not dead yet. Yeah, exactly. But you're a living legend. However, yeah, a living legend. No, yeah. Yeah, right. But and so creative and so inspiring and so many young people whose lives have changed because of having, have, having this influence in their life. And your life too can be changed yes. if, you, if you subscribe to BBC. <laughs> so do it, subscribe and yes, please uh, subscribe. Keep watching. It's William here in Thailand saying goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>